So um, uh, I, I decided to uh, to keep the introduction of my talk very brief because I knew um, uh, Professor Violi would do well. Um, so I'm, I'm going to dive right into um, um, the topic of uh, coagulopathy of, of ACLF and, and acute liver failure. Um, and I hope uh, Professor Violi will do the introduction later on. So um, this is the hemostatic balance in a, in a healthy individual. So a, a healthy balance between pro and anticoagulants, uh, avoiding bleeding and thrombosis. So, and, and as you're all aware, well aware of the, the concept of rebalanced hemostasis in patients with cirrhosis is becoming more and more accepted. So there's deficiencies both on the pro and the anticoagulant side uh, in patients with liver disease, leading to a, a net neutral balance uh, although this, this balance is, is less stable, so patients can experience both bleeding and thrombosis. So um, the theory of rebalanced hemostasis was really developed using patients that um, are not extremely sick, mostly compensated patients or, or patients that, that are decompensated but, but still in, in a stable condition. And then the question arises, what happens in patients when they become really ill? So what happens to patients with acute decompensation and ACLF and what happens to patients with acute liver failure. I will uh, try to convince you today that also these patients are in some sort of hemostatic rebalanced status. And I will um, uh, try to show you uh, data from both the clinic and the laboratory. So these are just a number of laboratory features to, to, to help you understand what we're talking about. So I'm comparing um, data mainly from, from my center on patients with mild cirrhosis, ACLF, and acute liver failure. And what you can see is that in, uh, in mild cirrhosis, platelet count and fibrinogen are relatively normal. And these really uh, decrease in, in acute and chronic liver failure, but not so much in ALF. Um, the platelet adhesive protein for bilibant factor is already elevated about three, threefold in patients with mild cirrhosis, and these values go up even further in sicker patients. Then a number of proteins that are, that are synthesized by hepatocytes, so derived from the liver, they're relatively normal, slightly decreased in patients with mild cirrhosis, but levels really go down, so 30% of normal uh, for most of these proteins in, in ACLF or ALF. And then uh, to, to, get, to give you a reference, INR relatively normal and mild cirrhosis, clearly elevated in ACLF and tremendously elevated in ALF. So I'll start with uh, discussing um, uh, coagulation changes in, in ALF because we have more clinical data in ALF. And it's important to realize that bleeding in ALF is actually quite rare. And this is in contrast to what is believed maybe 20 years ago. Uh, when, I, when I entered into this field, everybody, every hepatologist told me, okay, maybe bleeding is not so much an issue in patients with, with cirrhosis, but in ALF, these patients really bleed. Now, these are data from more than 1,700 patients from the um, United States Acute Liver Failure Study Group. And in these more than 1,700 patients, uh, less than 200 bleed, and the vast majority of bleeds are spontaneous upper gastrointestinal bleeds that have usually relatively little clinical consequences. So in this uh, cohort, bleeding was almost never um, a cause of death and also was almost never uh, associated with uh, invasive procedures, which is something that, uh, that, that we worry about, of course. So in, in ALF, bleeding is rare, despite the fact that platelets are low and the INR is high and all the other hemostatic changes that I, that I showed you. Interestingly, um, bleeding in patients with ALF is associated with platelet count with, um, so this is platelet count over time. So from uh, admission on, uh, during the first week. So in patients that bleed at some point, platelet counts are, are consistently lower, whereas INRs are the same in patients that, that experience bleeding or do not experience bleeding. So is then this lower platelet count the cause of bleeding? So I'm gonna make the argument that this is likely not the case because as I showed, the vast majority of, of bleeds in, in ALF are, are upper GI bleeds. Um, and it's likely that this bleeding is not related to hemostatic failure, but is a manifestation of, of systemic inflammation. Um, and these types of bleeds have been coined in literature as stress-related mucosal disease types of bleeds. And indeed, if you compare the bleeders versus the non-bleeders in this study of more than 1,700 patients, uh, 
uh, the bleeders uh, have much more uh, positive criteria of, of uh, systemic inflammation. So much more positive SERS criteria and much more systemic complications, including renal replacement therapy, um, severe encephalopathy and, and need for pressors. So, and there is also a link established in ALF between platelet count and systemic inflammation. So these are platelet counts over time and you can appreciate that with increasing number of positive SERS criteria, so with increasing uh, systemic inflammation, platelet count drops further. So the lower platelet count in the bleeders might simply be a reflection of systemic inflammation rather than that the low platelet count actually causes the bleed. So to summarize the clinical presentation of bleeding in ALF, again, bleeding complications are uncommon and usually clinically insignificant in, in modern days, in, at least in the, in the Western world. Bleeding complications are associated with the platelet count, not the INR, but thrombocytopenia may not be the cause of the bleeds because thrombocytopenia reflects systemic inflammation. And it has been postulated that the thrombocytopenia uh, reflects activation and subsequent clearance of platelets by this inflammatory process. So if these patients don't bleed and have abnormalities in, in routine tests, so that you place the count in the INR, uh, how does that connect to each other? Well, this might be explained when you do more um, global tests of hemostasis. So this is an, an earlier study of the um, ALF study group to which I uh, also participated of 50 patients with acute liver failure that we tested with um, a viscoelastic test, in this case, thromb thrombolistography or TAG. And interestingly, if you do a TAG in these patients, in the majority of patients, all parameters of, of the TAG, so all readings that you can get from the TAG tracing are within the normal range, despite the fact that the INR is very high. And 8% of these patients even had a hypercoagulable profile. So this uh, showed us that um, if you do more advanced testing of hemostasis, there's evidence of rebalanced hemostasis also in ALF. However, um, um, this result really depends on what test you exactly use. Because we recently um, basically repeated this experiment, but then not using TAG, but ROTEM, which is a very similar viscoelastic test. And the conclusion in that study, which was just published, is, is very, very different. Because in uh, patients with ALF, when tested with ROTEM, um, abnormal ROTEM parameters are frequent and indicate hypocoagulability. So it, you know, it depends on what you exactly measure, what, what, what answer you get to, on to what the hemostatic status of a patient with acute liver failure is. In the study, we also concluded that um, whether this increased, um, so the, the uh, more abnormal ROTEM parameters predisposed to bleeding, but whether that is causal, so whether the increased bleeding risk associated with a normal ROTEM indicates failure of hemostasis or again is a proxy for the disease severity um, is unknown and requires further study. So then we went on to um, study hemostasis in more detail. So the, the separate parts of hemostasis on, on platelets and coagulation and, and clot breakdown. Um, these are data that I've shown before. So uh, the platelet adhesive protein von Willebrand factor is highly elevated in, in patients with, uh, with ALF compared to controls. And LMTS13, which regulates um, von Willebrand factor reactivity is, is much lower in these patients. So this again is in a cohort of 50 patients. We very recently um, repeated these, uh, these experiments in a cohort of more than 600 patients uh, from um, the US Acute Liver Failure Study Group and found identical results. So this forbidden factor MTS-13 unbalance is actually highly prothrombotic. And we speculate that this in part um, compensates for the lower platelet count in these patients. So if you then look at coagulation, and we, and we uh, tend to do this with, with thrombin generation assays, um, again, you can see evidence for rebalanced hemostasis. So if you do thrombin generation experiments in, in healthy controls or in patients with ALF, um, there's really not so much difference. Um, so despite the fact that there is a defect in procoagulants, uh, 
uh, reflected by uh, uh, an uh, uh, elevated INR in these patients, there's also defects in anticoagulant pathways, and these rebalance each other, um, giving a net normal thrombin generation. And again, normal thrombin generation in ALF was recently confirmed in a much larger cohort. So if you dig deeper, if you test more accurately, uh, you find different things. So the INR suggests the bleeding tendency, but if you look deeper, um, uh, hemostasis is actually quite good, quite well preserved. And then finally, clot breakdown. So the phimolytic system is highly inhibited in patients with ALF. So these are uh, plasma-based clot lysis assays. And so the longer the clot lysis at, at time, the longer it takes for a clot to lyse in vitro. And many patients do not lyse at all in, during the course of this experiment. So there's normal thrombin generation, normal clot formation, and these clots are not broken down properly. Again, um, um, signaling a pro-thrombotic rather than a, than a bleeding tendency. Again, uh, these data are confirmed in, uh, recently in a larger cohort. So in ALF, there's, there's evidence of hemostatic rebalance. So low platelet count versus high thrombolement factor. Uh, a simultaneous decrease in both pro and anti anticoagulants, giving normal thrombin generation. But ALF also has hypercoagulable features, including defects in clot breakdown. And also on uh, TAG, you see that patients are, are may be hypercoagulable. And of note, in some clinical series, um, uh, thrombosis is more frequent than bleeding. So ALF definitely is not an overt bleeding disorder, but may have even thrombotic components. This is consequences for um, uh, management of the hemostatic status, which I will talk about in a minute. So we have argued that there are many reasons to avoid correction of abnormal laboratory tests. So correction of plated count with plated concentrate and correction of um, the prothrombin time or the INR by giving FFP or, or, or factor concentrates. Um, not only because bleeding is rare, uh, but also because we don't know um, uh, what to do and what levels to, to, uh, to reach with these transfusions. And importantly, the INR is a very good indicator of spontaneous recovery and prognosis in patients with ALF. If you would give FFP, um, this, this important indicator would be, would be um, uh, obscured. So we, we argue against um, uh, uh, at least prophylactic correction of laboratory tests by plasma platelets or, or other agents, factor concentrate, in, including recombinant 7A, um, because they may not help in avoiding bleeding and they may be harmful, for example, by inducing um, uh, thrombosis, both uh, systemically, but also within the, the diseased liver. So then on to, to ACLF. Um, there's actually very little known about the hemostatic system in, in patients with ACLF also because this is a relatively newly defined or redefined syndrome. Um, also, and I think this is an important comment, there's much less data on risk of bleeding and thrombosis in patients with ALF uh, compar uh, in ACLF compared to ALF for patients with more stable cirrhosis. So we have um, no clear documentation on, on what issues are with, uh, with hemostasis in these patients. Although, you know, everybody from clinical practice will know that, that these issues are there, but we need to catalog them better, I think. Um, in ACLF, there's also very little data on um, what part of the changes are really liver failure and what part of the changes are sepsis and multi-organ failure. We very recently published a, a small study in which we compared hemostatic status in patients with uh, ACLF compared to uh, patients with sepsis without underlying liver disease. And we showed actually that there's quite some overlap. So quite some changes that you see in ACLF, you also see in, in sepsis. So it's very hard to, to disentangle what is what in, in ACLF, what is really uh, liver failure and what is a criti critical illness. So again, we um, studied this in, in the laboratory and, and very similar features are seen in, in, in ACLF compared to, uh, to ALF. Um, this again is the plated adhesive protein relevant factor from healthy controls um, to stable cirrhosis, acute decompensation in ACLF. So you see a stepwise increase uh, in relevant factor. 
and similarly a stepwise decrease in LMTS 13 levels. So this unbalance that, that you see in, in ALF is also present in ACLF. Um, this again is, is thrombin generation assays and patients with um, both N ACLF make more thrombin compared to healthy individuals, despite the fact that they make um, uh, less clotting factors and have prolongations in their, in their INR. So really, again, um, if you dig deeper, you find um, uh, different results from, from what you expect from your routine laboratory. Um, again, uh, studies have been done using viscoelastic tests with, uh, with Rotem and TAG. And again, these two tell different stories. So TAGs are usually normal in patients with ACLF, which is what we've also seen in ALF. But ROTAMs are very frequently abnormal in ACLF. That's is also what we see um, in, in, in ALF. So this study from the Barcelona group shows comparing um, patients with acute decompensation in ACLF that ROTAM tracings get worse with increasing severity of illness. Um, whereas another study using TEC showed quite the opposite. So again, um, the stories are not completely clear yet, and it really matters what you what you measure. So I showed you um, coagulation results, both with from generation tests in plasma and, and with viscoelastic tests in whole blood. And these also these results not always align. And, and why is that? So it's important to to realize that these from generation assays are usually done in plated poor plasma, uh, and viscoelastic tests obviously in in whole blood. And, and um, uh, clearly the whole blood situation is, is preferred over plasma because that's more uh, physiological. However, um, what viscoelastic tests, uh, at least up until now, miss is the addition of thrombomodulin, which is a protein that's on endothelial cells and activates the anticoagulant protein C pathway. So viscoelastic tests really underestimate hemostatic potential because they lack one principal inhibitory component of, of hemostasis. And this is included in the thrombin generation assays I, I showed you. Um, also, when you see hypocoagulability in, in VETS, so mainly in ROTEM, it's primarily driven uh, in liver disease by decreasing platelet count. Um, but this platelet count, as I showed, just rebalanced by uh, increased levels of the platelet adhesive protein virulent factor. But the thing is that virulent factor needs flow for it to become adhesive to platelets. For that reason, viscoelastic tests are insensitive for, for virulent factor. Again, uh, leading to an underestimation of true hemostatic potential. So these are two, I think, important limitations of, of viscoelastic tests that we need to, at least need to realize when, when we interpret these tests. And then finally, the fibrinolytic system in acute decompensation on ACLF. And this is a, a complex situation because compared to controls, both in acutely decompensated patients and ACLF, there are some patients that clearly have accelerated hyperfibrolysis, which may predispose to bleeding, but there's also individuals, particularly in ACLF, um, that have inhibited fibrolysis. And again, um, just like we've seen in, in ALF, there's a proportion of patients that do not lyse at all in our test. Interestingly, these are patients with largely patients that have sepsis. And also in sepsis, without underlying liver disease, we know that pharmacolysis is inhibited. So um, this, is, this is complex, and this so may differ from patient to patient, and also may differ over time, of course. So um, in summary, I've, I've hoped to provide you with, with some data that there's he, uh, hemostatic rebalance, both in ACLF and ALF. And there's at least in ALF, also um, clinical evidence that, that this is true. So this hemostatic rebalance is a consequence of simultaneous changes in pro and, and anti-hemostatic pathways, bringing the balance from here to here, but still in balance. Bleeding is rare in, in acute liver failure, as I showed you. And as I also, also mentioned, bleeding and thrombosis in, in ACLF needs better, um, and needs to be better catalogued. The, the consequence of this finding of hemostatic rebalance, as, is, as it is in, in more stable cirrhosis, um, is that we need to be careful with, uh, with blood product administration. So um, we argue against 
uh, routine prophylactic correction of, of platelet count in INR um, uh, by FFP and, uh, and platelet concentrates because we don't know if it helps and it may do harm. With that, I would like to thank you very, very much for, uh, for the invitation to speak here um, and for your attention. Thank you.